So I, under God's gift of change, from last uh, Tuesday, I had the entire gospel story begins with God giving mankind the greatest gift ever given to anyone, anywhere. He so loved us that he gave his son. So that's what Christmas morning is all about. God giving the greatest son uh, gift ever. But then he's given us other gifts and what Jason called the gift exchanges. A lot of times in family, uh, that's where you see the most gift exchanges. Sometimes close friends exchange gifts. A lot of times if you buy a gift for someone who's not family or a close friend, it's not, probably not going to be reciprocated because they weren't expecting it from you. But when there's gift exchanging, that means brother buys for sister and sister buys for brother and so forth and so on. So using that analogy, we had the four bullet points that we went through Tuesday night. You can give God your worry, He'll give you His peace. I think we went on that one, don't you? And according, I, I took the, uh, to cut it shorter, I took out the actual verses and just commented on them. According to Philippians 4, 6 to 7, um, what we have to do is to experience this amazing peace is live a good life, among others. Remember that the Lord is coming. Don't yield to anxiety. Pray about everything and expect answers to those prayers. Did you know that's what Philippians 4, 6, and 7 tells us? That's, that's just a, a wrap-up on my part. But that's exactly what it tells us. God wants us to pray and thank Him for the answers. That's the expectancy God wants us to have when we pray. Pray and thank Him for the answers. Don't just thank Him for listening. I keep reminding myself. I do something maybe no other husband does. I don't know. Every morning when Barb goes to work, I walk her out, make sure she's in the car, kiss her goodbye, and say, drive safe. Then I go up on the sidewalk and I watch her drive to the end of our block where she turns left and gets out of sight. And every day, every day while she's driving that way, I say, Father, keep her safe. In Jesus' name I ask. For two reasons I do that. Number one, the Bible says that when we ask for things, we should expect answers up there in Philippians and thank Him for those answers. And number two, Jesus said, from now on you will not ask me for anything. Whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, He will give you. James wrote, the reason you don't have is because you don't ask. And when you do ask, you ask for the wrong reason. You ask amiss. You want a new Cadillac or something. You want to win the lottery, whatever. Those prayers don't get answered very often. Uh, but James said, you have not, because you ask not. I want Barb to come home every day from work. Yeah, that's good. So I pray every day she weeds. Father, Jesus told me that. I have, be uh, not because I ask not, I'm asking, keep her safe. Jesus also said, whatever I ask you in his name you will do. Keep her safe, bring her home to me tonight. So that's a little teaching on what Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 were saying. So the first bold point was, give God all your concerns and you'll experience his peace. The second was, give me your hurt. He'll give you his healing. Now we don't have in mind here all physical illnesses or physical uh, not illnesses, but there's other physical things like we get old and parts don't work like they used to or whatever. Um, there's all kinds of things there. But here in this, the idea of this healing is from what's ever hurting you. Things are messed up in your life right now. Give God that uh, hurt and He'll give you His healing. And so again... We have got to learn that Jesus isn't a liar. This is the biggest thing that holds us Christians back. We subconsciously think Jesus is a liar. You say, what are you talking about? I never think that. Really? Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father for in my name, he'll give it to you. Do you believe that? Do I believe that? If we don't believe it, we're thinking he's a liar. 
so the challenge is to say, God, forgive me for ever thinking Jesus lied to me. This is what he said. This is what I stand on. And so I'm not just going through some ritual when she drives away on the way to work. I'm standing on the almighty word of God. Keep her safe, Father. I ask you in Jesus' name. He promised me, if I asked in his name, you would do it. And so that's why I pray that way every day. So uh, when, when it comes to all the things that can hurt you in life, it's not all physical, but there's a lot of things. Uh, you can lose loved ones. You can lose all, all sorts of things. Uh, but he will give you, if we give him our hurts, our griefs, whatever they are, he'll give us his healing. Now, I don't know. I can't give you. I'd like to sit down some of the smartest preachers I know on the radio and pick their brains on that. Look it up in all the commentaries. But with commentaries, you can't always get the answer you, uh, question you want answered because they don't comment on that part. But, man, would I like to pick their brains. Uh, David Jeremiah, Charles Stanley, we'd have to raise him from the dead now to pick his brain. Chuck Swindoll. Uh, there's several on... Bach Network, that whose brains I'd like to pick. What do you think about this? Jesus said, whatever I asked him. Whatever I asked him. Now, there are qualifying statements throughout the epistles, like we have to ask things according to his will. James said, you have not because you ask not. When you ask, you ask for the wrong reason. You ask amiss. So if I ask God for Cadillac, I can't have confident... 100% confident faith he's going to give me a Cadillac. Because that's a selfie saying, I'd like a car that runs great. I've never, I've never owned a new car in my entire life. I'd like to have a new car before I die. Do I need it? So, I'm not sure I could ever pray with total confidence for a new car. Because I'm not sure that's the will of God. Excuse me. But the Bible does teach us in the epistles. <coughs> yeah, my wife's going to bring me a glass, a drink of water. Thank you. I don't know what I swallowed, but I need this. What an angel! Oh, that feels better. I can talk. Uh, but the Bible has qualifying verses in the epistles that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And one of those is, you have to ask things that are according to His will. Uh, I believe it is absolutely God's will to keep my wife healthy. And I pray with confidence for that every day. I really do. All right, so... But there are some people, and, and I don't know, this is what I'd like to ask all those preachers that I can set down. There are good Christian families that go on a road trip, get in a car wreck, and every Christian dies in that car. Every Christian dies in that car. My son, grandson, Nathan, was dating a girl for a little bit but she hadn't gotten through all the wounds and it didn't work out wonderful young Christian lady he was dating that was Nate right what dating he took her out to eat a time or two anyway one of us is wrong uh, any, anyway he absolutely loved this girl so much. He was at least mesmerized by her. So much. I said, uh, when she moved out of town, I, I asked him, uh, what do you think? Would, would she have liked your beard? He said, I'd have shaved it for her. I mean, he was really mesmerized by her. She moved out of town because it's her family that all died in that car wreck. She wasn't with them. She was mourning 
and it was just a short time before uh, her and Nathan knew each other, I think. And um, she would, I mean, how do you get through that? That probably takes years of prayerful praying first, God, help me believe there's still reason to be alive here. Uh, so I forget how many, I think there were three or four family members, everybody but her was in that car and they died. Why? Why? And here's what I'd like to ask all the smart preachers. James wrote, and I can't stress enough, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it was more than James, it was God talking. James wrote, You have not, because you ask not. You have not, because you ask not. If she'd prayed for her family before they got in the car and said, God, keep them safe, would they still be alive? I don't know. If, if she prayed in faith that God would give her anything she asked for in Jesus' name because Jesus said that, would they still be alive? I don't know. I'm not that smart. But I will tell you, I believe, if I have not because I ask not, I'm going to ask for her to come home to me every day. Every day. You say it might not help. I'll guarantee you it won't hurt. You say, it, well, it certainly won't help if I don't ask. It certainly won't help if I ask, but not in faith. But I tell you, I got my sights set on that thing. You, Jesus said, whatever I ask you, Father, in his name, you will give me. I'm standing on that. Keep her safe today. That's the fight of faith I fight daily. Every time she drives to work. Talk God, I hope it doesn't get out of the habit. She's got three weeks off of school now. you got to go somewhere every day so I can pray that God will keep you safe. All right. So, uh, and then we also went through, uh, you give God the, your grief, He'll give you His joy. You give God your faith, He'll give you eternal life. I'm going to stop there so we can get into it today. Um, beautiful Christmas lights. How many of you like Christmas lights? Oh man, did I blow it. You know what song I should have picked today? I was walking down the street, looking at decoration. Some were quite amazing. Spectacular creations. I guess I am singing it. Um, a song all about Christmas lights. Second verse is um, really relative to what we're going to be talking about here. But nonetheless, uh, you know, I see a few more in our neighborhood lights than I've seen in neighborhoods we've been, lived in lately. Uh, Third uh, Avenue, uh, Fifth Avenue. Not a lot here on 4th Avenue, but some. But uh, in around the corner from us on um, 28, there are some lit up houses. Uh, for, you know, Cliff used to light up everything like crazy on Avenue G. I mean, you needed sunglasses to drive down that street, really. And um, he doesn't do that anymore, but um, it, it was, for, first of all, he doesn't live there anymore. But, a lot of pretty lights out there. A lot of pretty lights. And so we're going to talk about Christmas lights. Three bullet points. I even put the three numbers in this bullet, and like uh, I did last week when we had four bullet points. I put three of them in here in the bulletin. Um, so bullet point number one. For this lesson, Beautiful Christmas Lights, the star shone bright. Everybody in here knows what story that is. That's the wise men and the star that leads them all the way to Bethlehem. Probably not all the way to the stable in the manger because... Most of us don't believe Jesus was a baby when the angels got there. 
We think he was a young boy a little bit under two years old. We think of that because King Herod asked them, how long ago did you see the star? And he must have told them, they must have told him about two years ago. Because he ordered every boy in Bethlehem two and under to be slaughtered. His soldiers rode that seven miles on their horses and slaughtered every little boy in that town because Herod did not want the king to be born. I'm going to tell you something. When God wants somebody born, ain't nothing anybody can do about it. So, the actual scripture said the wise men found the child in a house. It makes a beautiful manger scene to have them there uh, at the stable with the shepherds. It does. It makes it beautiful. Uh, in that song, Christmas Decorations, the second verse goes, uh, uh, there were shepherds before manger. They were worshiping a king. There were angels up above. I could swear I heard them sing. There were wise men bearing gifts, gold, franken- uh, myrrh, frankincense, and gold. I had to rearrange those words to get to the next rhyme. Myrrh, frankincense, and gold. And I could feel the warmth of Christmas drive away the bitter cold. Uh, so, manger scenes always include the wise men, even though in all likelihood they were not there. Uh, they were there a couple years later, or near, almost a couple years later. But, that amazing star was one of us. I got it right here. There's that amazing star. I got it right there. There's that amazing star. Uh, a star you could follow. I can't, I can't drive that home strong enough. A star you could watch, and you could get from there to there, watching that star. The closest thing we got to it today is the North Star. It'll let people out in the ocean know which way if they uh, if something breaks down uh, in their uh, devices. It'll let them know which way is north. Because it is, is it the top star in the tail that's the north star? Of the box? Okay. So it's of the little dipper part. Uh, it's one of those stars and every seafaring person knows which, which one it is on a starry night. If, if their instruments break down, they can look up and know which way is north. That's the closest thing we got to following a star. But this star led him right to a manger. What a Christmas light that is. Again, my son-in-law used to, on when he lived in Avenue G, lit up the place um, almost as much as um, uh, Chevy Chase and um, Christmas Vacation. Uh, I mean, he lit up the joint. He won two years, did you say? He won the best decorated house in town. He put lights on there. I, I tell you, as pretty as they were, as many as he put on there, as bright as it made his house, it wasn't anything like this star. This star led people somewhere around 900 miles to an exact spot where they needed to go. An amazing Christmas light display. Um, if it took two years, if they told Herod two years, it took two years, they probably had to stop a lot because God wanted them there when he wanted them there and there were probably nights that they didn't see the star. But when you're following a star, what do you have to do? You have to sleep in the day and travel at night. You just don't see them things in, in the daytime. So it, it's an amazing Beautiful Christmas light. All right, now, that's the first bullet point. Uh, Matthew uh, 2, verses, uh, that's supposed to be verses 1 and 2. I put 1 1 to 12 down. Uh, Verses 1 to 2, here's what it says. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. And again, according to Benson, a Greek scholar, 
uh, wise men meant a priestly caste among the Persians and Medes, which occupied itself principally with the secrets of nature, astrology, and medicine. Daniel became president of such an order in Babylon in Daniel 2.48. So, uh, they were the wise men that uh, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to ask questions of, uh, and he found so much wisdom in his prisoner, Daniel, that he made Daniel the head of that group. So, when you're a Gentile wise man looking for a star in the east, that points to the birth of a Jewish Messiah. What a glorious, beautiful Christmas light that must have been. It might have been the only Christmas light that was ever seen from 900 miles away. It was definitely the only Christmas light that could lead anyone on a 900-mile trip and get them to the exact place God wanted them to arrive at, the home of the child Jesus was living at when he was probably close to two years old. What an amazing star. So not only, and you wonder, because I don't know. That's why you wonder, why I wonder, because I don't know. Were the wise men the only people who ever saw that star? Did it stick out to everybody as a unique star? Did other people notice its movements? I don't know. We're not told. I'm on a know to need basis with God. He lets me know something when I need to know it. I don't need to know that. So, I don't know. But it was an amazing, amazing, beautiful Christmas light. Now, the second one. Flip the page over. Uh, to page 14. Now we see the more beautiful Christmas lights. The glory of the Lord shone around the angels. I'm sure you all know that bullet point number two is about the shepherds in the field. And the sky, first they see one angel talking to them, and then the sky is full of angels, and uh, which makes it, makes it beautifully easy to write certain choruses and such for Christmas songs the way it's worded. So the second one was the angels shown. Let me read this to you because I see something in here that uh, I'm going to tell you something today that might surprise you what some of the most beautiful Christmas lights are. Luke 2, verses 8 to 14. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. By the way, I read these things. Shepherds were not for the most part, nice people. They weren't invited to parties. They were often scoundrels who weren't totally honest with the people who owned the sheep. They smelled because they hung around the sheep all day, so that's one reason they didn't get invited to parties. But I tell you, some of the commentaries say they were scoundrels. They were not nice folk. Now you say, why are you emphasizing that? God didn't have Herod come and show Jesus off to him. God didn't have princes and kings and royalty from other countries come to show his son off to. He had people that needed saved come to show Jesus off to. Is that amazing or what? I don't think I've ever thought in those terms before this year. When you got three bullet points to make a sermon out of, you try to dig a little deeper. And uh, so that's, that's an amazing thing when you start reading about what some of the commentaries have to say about the shepherds. And uh, just don't, they weren't well thought of by the populations that they were from. They just weren't. That's the group that God lit up the sky for. That's the group that most people didn't like. You know, God came today and wanted to draw attention, not a second come, but He was doing some other thing amazing, and He needed to get the attention of the church. Um, you'd like a, wouldn't you like it if we were in the group 
He included in all that? I don't know. Maybe he'd look for the scoundrels. Because they need to know. They need to know. So the first people at the manger besides husband and wife and the son that was just born were low lives. So what do we learn from that? We learn one thing for certain. We learn God wants to save the low lives. Now I want to talk about these beautiful Christmas lights, these angels. Let me read this story now. Luke uh, 2, uh, starting at verse 8. There was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, starts out with one, the angel of the Lord shone round about them, or the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. So the angels see something out at night, check on the flock, and here's this fella who's not like any other fella they've ever seen. He radiates. He is such a beautiful Christmas light. His Christmas light shines around the shepherds. The shepherds become part of the Christmas display. The low lives are the yard decorations. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Why is that important? Well, I'll get to that in a while. So the shepherds were part of the most beautiful Christmas lights ever, people needing a Savior, radiating. Now, as the story goes on, that angel said in verse 10, Fear not, uh, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people, even you low lives. For unto you, in verse 11, this day in the city of, of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord... Oh, it's born. I forgot the most important word there. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe. Guys, we didn't just light you up for no reason at all. You're on a treasure hunt tonight. I'm going to show you where the babe is. I didn't just come to tell you the good news. I'm telling you, you're going there to witness it with your own eyes. You might not get invited to anyone else's party, but God is inviting you to His party. You're going to find the babe. You're going to find the babe in the city of David. And He's going to be wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger or a trowel that you put the food for the cows to eat. Not deity like the king of England. Not deity like any of the kings you read about in the Bible, David or any of the others. But king of kings. King of kings, Lord of lords, is born and lied in a food trial for cows. We call it a manger. They put some straw in there to make it more comfortable for them. So not only is he born in a very lowly way, by at that point a very poor family, get, they get more money later, but from the three wise men in a couple of years. But at that point, don't have much. And they go to be taxed, registered, so they can take what money he has. Governments love to know where you're at, don't they? Yeah. They love to know where you're at so they can get your money. And um, was no different then. 
But God invites losers to be the first people that I can see in the gospel narrative of Matthew and Luke, the two stories that talk about the birth of Christ. The first people besides Joseph and Mary to see the baby are people nobody wants to be around. But more than that, before they go there, they become part of God's beautiful Christmas display in the garden. We didn't read that whole story. What happens next is more angels show up and they're all radiating. I mean, the sky is bright. Here's something else I'd like to ask all the smart preachers. Did anybody anywhere else than where those shepherds were see everything lit up? Was that a private showing for them? You say, well, if the sky was up, other people would see it. Really? God can do whatever He wants to do. Did anyone else see the star that led the white men? We don't know. Anyone else but the shepherds see the brightness? We don't know. Somebody living in a house five miles away might not have seen anything. But those shepherds became part of the beautiful Christmas lights when all these angels lit up the entire area and just the one angel, the first one there, his light shone round about the shepherds. It was so bright. Now, angels don't have lights. They're reflecting the glory of God because they're in His presence. And so before they came here, they've been getting their directions from God and they were radiating. It said the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Not the glory of the, uh, of the angels. The glory of the Lord that was reflecting from the angels shone round about the shepherds and they became part of the Christmas display. All right, now, going to get better. Third bullet point, Jesus is the light of the world. John 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. If something came from nothing to be something, Jesus was involved is what that verse is saying. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light that shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, except the darkness of the shepherds. They figured it out. But the darkness of everybody else at that time didn't understand anything special happening that night. Jesus was the light that created everything. Without Him... In, in, uh, in, what's the word I'm looking for? In tandem, I don't know if that's the right word, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, Jesus created all things. So all three, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, were involved in everything that was ever created. Everything. In this one being born, Jesus came into the world to be the light of the world. And so, his birth was announced by two lights. The star to the wise men, and the light of God reflecting from the angels to the shepherds. The light of the world might have meant more to the wise men and the shepherds than it meant to anyone else. Because they'd seen God light things up. Now, John eight twelve takes it a little further. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in darkness, but shall have, have uh, the light of life. This final Christmas display, folks, is you and me. We're now the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world, and the Scripture tells us you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid. 
you don't light a candle and put it under something so nobody gets light from it. He said, go shine. The greatest Christmas displays we don't didn't even know were Christmas displays that you and me. We're supposed to light up the world with the good news about Jesus Christ. Now people walking by us aren't quite as impressed as those that seen the angels in the field or the those that seen the miracle star in the sky. They don't see things radiating from us. But we're the light of the world and the fact that we know the light who is Jesus and we know that he's the only one who can get us from here to there to heaven and sometimes we sit on that information and don't tell the scoundrels God told the scoundrels the shepherds we are the most beautiful lights of Almighty God on this planet today, followers of Jesus, were the only hope for people driving around looking at Christmas decorations. If they're lost, we're the only hope of them finding Jesus. You and I that have the light of Jesus shining through us. That's it.